Well, <clears throat> I've already read the text, so now let's go ahead and dive into it, beginning with what we looked at last week. Remember, last week we saw two examples of what Jesus meant when he said to his disciples before he sent them out to teach in the villages and towns around Galilee, and as he would say to us today, that we should be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. First, when Paul was dragged from the temple, remember, and was about to be beaten to death, that he was rescued by a Roman tribune. I like to, to use the word tribune. It's the same word we find in our passage that is commander, okay, so we don't get confused. But after he was apprehended by the tribune, he asked him to allow him to speak to the Jews. Though they had just tried to kill him, Paul still wanted to save them, you know, and I think, again, that's the great heart of the Apostle Paul. It's the love that Christ has given to him for his people. And he had that same love for the governors, the kings, the, the Gentiles. That's the kind of love that he gives his people for the lost, and that's what we need to be using, again, the different means God has given to us to be built up in this kind of love. But he did it because he loved them. But again, they cried out for his death, and the tribune, still not knowing why, decided to scourge Paul to find out. And as they were preparing for the procedure, Paul asked the centurion who was overseeing this, is it lawful to scourge a Roman citizen when he was as yet untried and not found guilty? When the tribune found out, he asked Paul whether this was true and found that Paul was actually born a citizen. And when that happened, he became afraid and those holding him immediately let go. Again, Paul using wisdom without offending, without, without breaking any commandments in order to avoid this scourging, which is a very serious matter. The second time was when the tribune brought him before the Sanhedrin. When Paul saw the trial was going essentially against him from the start and that nothing was to be gained for the kingdom through this abuse, noting that half of the assembly were Pharisees and the other half Sadducees, he immediately divided them by aligning himself with the Pharisees on the issue of the resurrection and life after death, something the Sadducees denied, and again, creating this huge turmoil. And again, he escaped. Now again, in both cases, Paul acted very shrewdly to avoid unnecessary injury, but he did so without compromising the gospel or his integrity. And again, we noted last time that, you know, how many times do we see the Apostle Paul putting his comfort and his safety and his life on the line? How many times he suffered? He was not afraid to suffer for this, for his, the cause of our Lord's kingdom, if by suffering it would advance it. But if his suffering would actually work against the Lord's cause, which it would here, uh, when we see what the Lord was actually planning, he didn't have any problem avoiding it. We even see our Lord Jesus Christ on several occasions avoiding possible suffering. Now, on one occasion, uh, the, the, the people in the synagogue in Nazareth took him to the edge of a cliff and they were going to throw him over the cliff. But Jesus escaped them. He simply walked through the midst and, and departed. But when it came time to advance the kingdom of heaven through his death, he gave himself over to his enemies to suffer and die. There are times when we need to suffer, and times when we don't need to suffer. Now, last week, Luke ended with Jesus telling Paul that it was his intention to bring him to Rome, where there he might have the honor of bearing witness to what Jesus had done to save all who would believe. This morning, we see this promise beginning to unfold as the Lord helps Paul escape the plot of the Jews to kill him. Now again, as I said, our overarching point here is when the Lord makes a promise, first of all, there is nothing that can stand in the way of His fulfilling that promise. But this passage reminds us that that doesn't mean that we do nothing. The fulfillment of His plan often entails effort on our part. It entails means. You know, God doesn't work apart from means. He actually works through means most often. Now, first, we see the Jews' plot against Paul. Again, Jesus had just said to Paul in verse 11, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. 
Now, the encouragement which, you know, which Jesus wanted Paul to take from this, uh, since it was his plan for him to witness in Rome, was that he would deliver him. Okay, not just from the Jews in Jerusalem, but from anything that might possibly stand in his way. I mean, we only have to think ahead in the book of Acts, and we know that Paul's going to be facing very soon, you know, this storm out at sea and a shipwreck. Well, see, whatever it is that might possibly take Paul's life, the Lord was going to deliver him from these things. Now, he wasn't saying that Paul would suffer. You know, the Lord's plans often involve hardship. Again, just read 2 Corinthians, you'll see the catalog of things that Paul went through. But what Jesus meant was that no one would be able to take away his life until he had finished his ministry, at least in Rome. That's what this promise implies, doesn't it? At this point, Paul was essentially immortal. And you know, the, the interesting thing is that the same thing is true of us, isn't it? Right? As long as the Lord has something for us to do in this world, Nothing and no one can take away our lives from us. doesn't mean we can't suffer, okay? We can. But we will not die until the Lord is done with us. Now, this was important for Paul to know because of what was coming. The next day we read, Over 40 Jews bound themselves by oath neither to eat nor drink until they had killed him. Literally, they were pronouncing a curse on themselves. May, the, may we be cast away, may we, may we be anathema if we fail in our mission to kill Paul before he makes it, uh, well, actually before he comes down to the council. Okay. Now, we need to understand how serious this is. Okay. To bind yourself by oath or to vow to the Lord that you're going to do something is a very serious matter. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 23, verse 21, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. And Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 and 5, when you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Now, again, I just say this because we've all made promises. We've all made vows to the Lord, haven't we? We need to make sure we take those things seriously because the Lord obviously takes them seriously if we're actually making a lawful vow. You see, in this case, they're not. They shouldn't take this one seriously. But they thought they were making a lawful vow. They thought they were doing God's service when, as a matter of fact, they were working against his purposes. Now, their vow was that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. And what this means is that it was their intention to fulfill this as quickly as possible. I mean, how, how long do you want to go without eating and drinking? It shows how serious they are, but it also shows we're going to do this quickly. And so they asked the chief priests, the elders, and the council to request that Paul be brought back to the council under the pretense of questioning him more carefully while they lie in wait to kill him before he would arrive. Now again, I just, just note the extreme hatred that these Jews had for Paul, that they had for the gospel essentially. It's not really Paul they hated, but it's who he represented, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was because of his gospel that, that they hated him. And note particularly the hatred that unbelievers who believe that they know the truth have for the gospel, who think they know better. And by the way, is there, is there really anyone who isn't a religious unbeliever? Everybody has their religion, whether it's human secularism, atheism, whether it's you know, Islam or whatever it may be. Everybody has a belief system, and when we go against that belief system, People get angry, and why is it they do? Well, Jesus tells us in John 3, verses 19 and 20, this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. 
you know, whenever the light of truth shines on, on somebody who's doing something that's wrong, they don't like to be called on the carpet. They don't like for their sin to be exposed. I mean, think about our own experience with, with God's Word. Have you ever run across something in the Bible that you said, you know, I don't like what it says there because I'm actually doing this thing and it tells me I can't do it. Well, that, that's, that's a problem for us, right, as believers, because we love the light. And we come to the light and we want the light to expose all of our sins so that we can turn away from those things and begin to do the things that are honoring to the Lord. But again, with regard to unbelievers, we shouldn't be surprised if somebody gets angry at us for shining the light of the gospel in their face. Uh, you know, have you ever shared the gospel with someone and had them get angry at you? This is the reason, because it's exposing something they don't want to be exposed. But let's take an encouragement from this as well. We shouldn't be surprised if we shine that light and there are people who are interested because the Lord uses this light also to find His sheep. This is the way He sorts them out in a way that we can tell who's being sorted is how they respond to the gospel. But again, it's the only way we can find the sheep. We have to shine the light on everyone to see who's who and to try to bring those sheep into the fold. Now again, the Lord had promised to protect Paul, but as I've said before, that didn't mean nothing needed to be done. We begin to see now the Lord's intervention, but an intervention that comes through means. He, really, the Lord is involved in everything that happens in this world, isn't He? It's only when we begin to see things turn in what we consider to be a more positive direction that we begin to acknowledge that the Lord is at work. But He is at work through everything that's going on in this world. He's at work right now in the war between Russia and the Ukraine. It's not when things begin to turn as we'd like to see them that He's involved. He's involved now. And He's going to bring glory through to Himself through these things. Well, Luke tells us first that Paul's nephew overheard their plan and came and told him. Now, again, I hope you don't mind, but as I'm going through this text, I'm also noting particular items that uh, we, we don't want to build sermons on, but we don't want to miss. This is the only reference we have in the Bible to Paul's family. We know certain things about Paul. We know he wasn't married, for instance. Remember how he writes to the Corinthians and tells them that he desired that all men were as he was, unmarried and free to give themselves completely to the Lord's service. But he also realized that that requires a particular gift that not everybody has. Well, Paul had that gift. He wasn't married. Apparently, he also had a sister, and a sister who at least at one time was married and had a son. Now, as to why they were in Jerusalem, we don't know, uh, we, or at least why the son was there. Perhaps they lived there. It's possible that maybe this young boy, um, you know, if we assume that Paul's sister was from Cilicia as he was, uh, maybe got married there, maybe the young boy had gone to Jerusalem in order to study the law and to become a Pharisee uh, the way that Paul had. Um, or maybe hearing that Paul was in Jerusalem under arrest, maybe the family came in order to support him there. We don't really know. But we do know this, that Paul's nephew overheard the plot and he told Paul. Secondly, when Paul heard this, he called for a centurion. And he asked that his nephew be taken to the tribune. And when he arrived, the tribune, notice, took him by the hand, which I think leads us to conclude that Paul's nephew was likely still relatively young. It would be hard to see the tribune taking a full-grown man by the hand and taking him aside. But he asked him, what is it that you have to report? And his nephew related to him the entire plot. Now third, the tribune warned him not to tell anyone that he had reported this. If the Jews learned that their plot had been discovered, they would change it, and the tribune would lose his advantage. I mean, he now knows the enemy's strategy that gives him a tremendous advantage. So next, he puts together an armed escort. Notice that was really well equipped. Two centurions with 200 soldiers, 70 men on horseback, 
and 200 spearmen. Now, A.T. Robertson, the, the great Greek scholar, tells us that these were the three kinds of soldiers that the troops would be made up of in the Roman army. Okay? The soldiers under the centurions were the men who were heavily armed. The horsemen were the cavalry. Okay? The spearmen, they were more lightly armed with, with a lance or a javelin, but they were meant to be supplementary to the troops. This is a rather large army that he's put together. So in total, we have here a group of 470 armed men to protect Paul against this uh, uh, cabal of 40-plus Jews, okay? giving them an advantage. I'd say a slight advantage, 10 to 1. Okay? Now the tribune stacked the deck even further in Paul's favor by ordering his men to leave at the third hour of the night. That's 9 o'clock in the evening, about the third hour after sunset, and this would give them the added cover of darkness. You know, doing things in the dark can, uh, can be helpful. You know, it can be more sneaky. And then he gave Paul a horse, which would make Paul then a more difficult target to hit. A horse gives somebody a tremendous advantage in warfare, which is the reason why the Lord didn't want Solomon, for instance, or any of the kings of, of Judah or Israel to multiply horses because, again, they would trust in the horse. And, and not in the Lord. The tribune wanted to make sure that Paul made it safely to Caesarea where Felix the governor resided. So in doing this, doing all the things we've just seen, he was simply carrying out Jesus' plan to keep Paul safe. This was Jesus' plan to keep him safe. Although looking at it, humanly speaking, we might say, well, how was Jesus involved in this? But he was every step of the way. These things were the steps he was taking to make sure Paul would be safe. Paul's nephew overhearing, telling the tribune, the tribune, the steps he made, and these troops, they were all a part of the means the Lord was going to use. Now, the tribune also included a letter detailing why he was sending Paul. Now, it tells us a few things about the tribune, mainly. In it, first of all, he identifies himself as Claudius Lysias. This is the first time we've heard his name. Now, Claudius was a, a Roman name, and he likely took this name from Emperor Claudius when the tribune became a Roman citizen. Lysias was his Greek name, the name which he had before he bought his freedom and became a Roman citizen. Now, we don't know very much more about the tribune, except we do know that um, he was a sinful human being and one who was obviously concerned about keeping his position in the Roman army. How do we know that? Well, first of all, the honor he shows Felix. He calls him the most excellent governor. Most excellent was an honorary title of office. It is the same one Luke used of Theophilus. Remember the, the man to whom... His gospel and the book of Acts is, what would you say, um, ah, the word escapes me. But anyway, he's, he's dedicating these books to him. He calls him most excellent Theophilus, which means he was likely a man who was a high-ranking Roman official. So Lysias is first showing Felix this honor. But then he goes on to recount the events that led up to the sending of Paul. And there's one thing about this recounting that stands out that's significantly different. From Luke's account, I don't know if you noticed it when I was reading through, is that he omits the part where Paul was almost scourged. Okay, why would he do that? Well, because that was a serious breaking of the law. But he also amends the story and says that when he found out that Paul was a Roman, he went and rescued him. Okay, well, you know what? When he rescued him, he didn't know he was a Roman. It was only while he was preparing to scourge him that Paul said something about it. So he was changing the story, okay? Not only would this help to keep him off the hook, you know, for his crime, but it actually would paint him as a hero. <laughs> now, we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, Claudius Lysias was like any other sinful human being who cares about his own safety and his position and wants to hang on to it. Now, in this letter, the tribune also included why his accusers were angry. We don't really hear that he had understood anything about the issue up to this point. But what he understands had nothing to do with the Roman system. It was not a chargeable offense. 
It had to do with their law. Basically, that's a matter that, that, is, that is their concern and not ours. And he also includes the part about notifying his accusers to bring the charges to Felix. Now, I think this shows us, again, something we shouldn't be surprised by. The tribune did not understand the issues. He didn't know what was going on. He didn't know what was at stake. Why are these Jews so upset over some issue that has to do with the law? Well, what he didn't understand was it was the gospel. And he didn't understand the issue because he didn't know what the Jews believed. He didn't know what Paul believed. He didn't know what he should believe, right, in order to be saved. And really, that's the problem with most unbelievers, isn't it? They really don't understand. You know, we assume everybody in our culture understands, has heard the gospel at some point. They've been raised in some kind of church. But we really can't assume that. And even if they have, we, we can't assume that they really understand the gospel. And as long as they don't understand it, they're in a very dangerous situation. They need to hear the gospel. And that's why Jesus commands us to bring the gospel to them. We are the means by which he will reach them. Now, finally, we see the plan was successfully carried out. They took Paul first to Antipatris, uh, which is a city built by Herod the Great in honor of his father, Antipater. It was a journey of about 30 miles. Maybe that's another reason why they put Paul on the horse, because they had to move <laughs> relatively quickly, 30 miles. That's a long way to cover. But once they reached Antipatris, they sent the soldiers, notice, and the spearmen back, while the horsemen continued with Paul the rest of the way to Caesarea, which was still another 25 miles. That, that's a significant journey. Now, why did they send, I mean, why did they send the, the one group back? <laughs> I was thinking kind of a humorous reason. Maybe they thought the Jews who had neither you know, eaten or drunk all that, all that time frame had basically run out of gas and they were no longer a threat. You know, well, but they did send the cavalry, okay, just in case they didn't. By the way, a question that always comes into my mind when I read this text is, whatever happened to these Jews, right, these 40-plus men who took this vow? Well, it turns out that the Jews didn't take their vows terribly seriously. Remember how Jesus, you know, rebuked the Pharisees on one occasion for making these promises based upon the temple or the gold in the temple or these various things, and they were wiggling out of the commitments they were making to the Lord? They, they likely did the same thing here as well. All these men had to do would be to go to their Jewish leaders who would absolve them from these vows. Again, relatively easy thing to take place. So I don't think any of these men actually perished, which was a good thing because it gave them a little bit more time perhaps to be reached by the gospel before they actually did die. Now when the entourage arrived, they presented the tribune's letter along with Paul to Felix. And when he read it, he learned he was from Cilicia. He agreed to give Paul a hearing when his accusers arrived. And so he kept him in Herod's Praetorium, which is essentially the judgment hall until they did. Now again, the Lord was fulfilling his, his promise to bring Paul to Rome. This is just the first part of it. Through these events, he's keeping him safe until he did so that Paul could bear witness in Rome. Jesus had a plan and he was fulfilling that plan. <coughs> but the way he did it was through these several different means, these several different events. Now, just taking that principle, let me just apply it briefly and say these few things. The Lord's promises, His, you know, His plan, His purposes, they are generally fulfilled through means. You know, if, if we read in the Bible that God is going to, you know, basically bring His gospel to the world, we shouldn't assume it's going to happen as His people just sort of sit around and wait for it to happen, right? We, we have to be involved. His promises mean our efforts most often. A few examples. The Lord, well, let me ask you, does he promise in his word that he will help us to overcome our sins? Uh, yes, right? Does that mean that I can just simply say, Lord, help me to overcome my sins, and it's just going to happen sort of supernaturally as I sit there? No, I still have to fight against my sins. I still have to try to avoid the things that tempt me. 
I need to put on the opposite righteous behavior that the Lord calls me to, to put on. I need to look to Him daily for strength. There are things that I need to do. I need to fight against that sin. The Lord promises He's going to save His people. He's going to find those lost coins, those lost sheep, okay? But are they going to be found without effort on our part? No, we need to go to them and we need to witness to them. We need to share the gospel with them. We need to pray for them, right? But not just pray, we need to communicate truth. He promises to bring His kingdom. But again, we need to work to advance that kingdom. And you know, one thing we don't often think about, which I was kind of hedging at towards the beginning, the Lord promises that He's going to bring us to heaven if we are trusting in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is a passage in, I think it's Matthew 11, verse 12, where He talks about the kind of effort that we need to make in order to enter into heaven. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. What was Jesus talking about there? Is he saying a bunch of wicked men are trying to get into the kingdom using their own efforts? No, what he's saying is that from the time John began to preach repentance, even through the time in which he is preaching, there are those that, that the Spirit of God is working in to give them this kind of holy violence to overcome their sins and to press forward into the kingdom of heaven, reminding us what Paul says about himself in 1 Corinthians 9, that he runs the race that, that, you know, to enter into heaven, but runs in such a way that he may win. He, he boxes, but not beating the air, but he buffets himself. He fights his flesh in order that he may overcome it so that he may do the Lord's will so that he may at last enter into heaven. Does that mean that Paul is working to save himself? No, but by his doing these things, he is showing that his faith in Christ is genuine because this is what Jesus calls him to do. What he gives him, the Spirit of God that works within him to do. Again, remember the, you know, the opening passage here where he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will or to desire and to work for His good pleasure. So even entering into heaven, there are means that the Lord is using uh, to, to get us there and things that, that we do need to be doing. Now again, His promise does not mean that there will be no work for us to do, no work on our part. But what it does mean is this. His promise means that He will bless the efforts that we make in all of these different areas. He will make them successful. See, we would just be beating the air if there was no promise. Our, our efforts would come to nothing. But the fact that the Lord has made these promises to us guarantee that His ends will actually be achieved through the efforts that we make. So again, let's not see it as an either or. Let's see how these things work together. And let's work together with the Lord to accomplish His purposes. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us do this.